Good evening. Welcome to our Good Friday service here at St. Paul's. We're glad that you're with us. We hope you can join us again. Tonight we're going to have what's called a tenebrae service. Tenebrae is a Latin word that means darkness. Um, it's also a service that focuses on, on Jesus' seven words, the seven times he spoke from the cross. This is a service of readings. You'll see quite a few of them in the bulletin this evening. It's also a service of prayer and devotion, meditation and reflection on what Christ did for us on the cross. We'll follow the service the way as it's printed for us in the service folder. Um, we'll begin by singing the first hymn.
A reading from Isaiah chapter 53, a prophecy of Jesus' death and his resurrection. Look, my servant will succeed. He will rise. He will be lifted up. He will be highly exalted. Just as many were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man, and his form was disfigured more than any other person, so he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him, because they will see something they had never been told before, and they will understand something they had never heard before. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root from dry ground. He had no attractiveness and no majesty. When, he, when we saw him, nothing about his appearance made us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man who knew grief, who was well acquainted with suffering. Like someone whom people cannot bear to look at, he was despised, and we thought nothing of him. Surely he was taking up our weaknesses, and he was carrying our sufferings. We thought it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted, but it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for the guilt of our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all have gone astray like sheep. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has charged all our guilt to him. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb, he was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent in front of his shears, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away without a fair trial and without justice. And of his generation, who even cared? So he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of the rebellion of my people. They would have assigned him a grave with the wicked, but he was given a grave with the rich in his death, in his death because he had done no violence and no deceit was in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to allow him to suffer. Because you made his life a guilt offering, he will see offspring. He will prolong his days and the Lord's gracious plan will succeed in his hand. After his soul experiences anguish, he will see the light of life. He will provide satisfaction. Through the knowledge of him, my just servant will justify the many, for he himself carried their guilt. Therefore, I will give him an allotment among the great, and with the strong he will share plunder, because he poured out his life to death, and he let himself be counted with rebellious sinners. He himself carried the sin of many, many and he intercedes. For the rebels, the word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, most holy, look with mercy on this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, be given over into the hands of the wicked, and suffer death upon the cross. Keep us always faithful to him, our only Savior, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 27th chapter. At the same time, two criminals were crucified with him, one on his right and then one on his left. People who passed by kept insulting him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, experts in the law, and elders kept mocking him. They said, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, because he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, even the criminals who were crucified with him kept insulting him. The Gospel of the Lord. We'll continue now by singing the next hymn, hymn number 431.
Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They cast lots to divide his garments among them. O Lord Jesus Christ, touch us with your hands, which the sins of the world pierced with the nails, and forgive our ignorance. For, Lord, we knew not, indeed we know not, what we did in sinning against you. Touch us to forgive and to bless, O Lord, for your endless mercy's sake. The choir will now sing.
there was also an inscription written above him, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging there was blaspheming him, saying, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God since you are under the same condemnation? We are punished justly for we are receiving what we deserve for what we have done, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Amen, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. O Lord Jesus Christ, look on us with your eyes as you looked upon the thief on the cross, that with him we may confess our sins and ask humbly, Lord, remember us when you come into your kingdom. And by your same voice, be comforted for your endless mercy's sake. We continue by singing hymn number 419.
Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene were standing near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time this disciple took her into his own home. O Lord Jesus Christ, fill us with your love, as in your pain you did comfort your mother and provide for her need, and gave her both home and son. To such love without compare, without limit, lead us, O Lord, now and forever. The choir will now sing.
From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said this fellow was calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran, took a sponge, and soaked it with sour wine. Then he put it on a stick and gave him a drink. The rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. For Lord Jesus Christ, fill us with your faith since in your last agony you cried to your father, my God, my God, that no suffering, no shadow of doubt may darken our trust in God nor separate us from your father and ours now or ever. Choir when housing.
After this, knowing that everything had now been finished, and to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they put a sponge soaked in sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. O Lord Jesus Christ, lead us to see your thirst as you suffered in your humanity, that we might drink from you and never thirst again, but live in your Father's house forever for your tender mercy's sake. The choir now sing, contrary to what the bulletin says, the choir will sing all three of the verses. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. 
O oh Lord Jesus Christ, give us your strength as you resolve to do your Father's work and finish it. That morning and evening we live in hope, knowing that your great work for us is completed. To the glory of your holy name. Choir will now sing. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun was darkened. Then the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, give us your trust, unquestioningly, complete as on the cross you committed your spirit to your Father, that whatever may happen, we may rest in the same everlasting arms. For your endless mercy's sake. We we'll continue by singing hymn number 430.
A reading from Matthew 27. After Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Suddenly, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks were split. Tombs were open. And many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised to life. Those who came out of the tomb went into the holy city after Jesus' resurrection and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus with him saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they were terrified and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, imagine you were standing there on Calvary the day that Jesus died. What would it be like? There would be so much to take in, so many things to see, so many things to hear. You know, the Bible doesn't ever actually describe what this scene looked like. It just tells us what happened. And it doesn't tell us what it sounded like either. But what it does do is it tells us what people said. So what would you have heard that day? Voices. The voices of the Jewish leaders, the chief priests, the elders, the experts in the Old Testament law, saying, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God now save him if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. You know, they got what they wanted. Jesus was hanging on that cross, but that wasn't enough for them. They hated him so much that they couldn't stop spitting venom, even when he was dying. There were other voices. The people passing by. You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from that cross if you are the king, if you are the king of the Jews, the son of God. If you stood close enough to the cross, you would have heard the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Maybe you would have even heard the criminals who were crucified with Jesus, mocking him. One of them said, you're the Christ, aren't you? Save yourself and us. So much hatred. So much cruelty. Where did it come from? You know, we could spend a lot of time this evening dissecting the different kinds of hatred that were showed that day. And we would probably learn something about ourselves in the process. But tonight, I want to focus on what all of those statements have in common. Every single one of them was a sarcastic demand for proof. You said you were the Son of God. Prove it. You said you were the promised Messiah. Prove it. Come down from that cross. And we can understand why the people standing there said those things, can't we? I mean, what was the total sum of the evidence of Good Friday? Jesus certainly did not look like the Son of God. He did not look like the promised Messiah. Why would the Son of God let people taunt and mock him while he was hanging from a cross? Why would the promised Messiah be helpless in front of mere people? Surely God and Savior could come down from that cross. And if God the Father really loved Jesus, why would he leave him there in the hands of people who hated him so much? The evidence was all against Jesus that day. He was crucified between two criminals. That was a very striking visual. And Matthew points us to something else that happened that day. The sun stopped shining for three hours, right in the middle of the day. That was God giving evidence that the events of Good Friday were certainly great and terrible. But what did that darkness mean? Jesus liked to talk about the outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is the outer darkness? It's hell. And I think there's a connection here. Right in the middle of those seven words from the cross, Jesus spoke one that's absolutely crucial for our understanding of what was happening that day. 
He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now it's true, Matthew tells us that the people standing there by the cross didn't understand him. He cried out in Aramaic, and apparently those people didn't know that language very well because they thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah to come and rescue him. But we know what he said. We know what it meant. God the Father abandoned Jesus on the cross. What do we have to conclude from this evidence, from the darkness, from God abandoning him? Jesus suffered hell itself on the cross. And the Old Testament underlines that understanding. It says that everyone who is hung on a tree is cursed, which is Old Testament language for condemned to hell. To the Jews, being crucified symbolized being abandoned by God to hell. And my friends, if that were the only evidence we had, would we have to conclude that those people who taunted Jesus on Good Friday were right? And by extension, that all those people today who reject everything that Jesus claims for himself have to be right. But that is not all the evidence that we have. We 21st century Christians who know how the story ends also know the greatest evidence, the greatest proof of all. Easter Sunday, the Bible, uses Jesus' resurrection as proof, proof that he is the Son of God and that all that he says to us is true. Proof that the death cannot hold us anymore, that the grave cannot hold us anymore, that it held him. Proof that all our sins are paid for and forgiven. But you know what? God didn't wait till Sunday to give us proof about what Jesus claimed. At the end of those three hours of darkness, God provided evidence that all that Jesus said was true. The temple curtain was torn in two. Do you know what the temple curtain was? In the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, there was this inner room called the Most Holy Place or the Holy of Holies. God had taught his people to think of him as being in that room. And since God is holy and we're sinners, no one could go into that room. Only the high priest could go in, and only once a year. So at any given moment, there was one maybe two or three people alive who had ever seen the inside of that room. And at the moment that Jesus died, an invisible hand ripped that curtain in two. God himself reached down from heaven and he tore apart the barrier that keeps us sinners out of his presence. God gave us proof that our sins were paid for on the cross. And if that weren't dramatic enough for you, Matthew tells us that the earth shook and rocks split. There was an earthquake. And then Matthew says, tombs were opened. And bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised to life. At least three times during his ministry, Jesus had raised people from the dead. He saved others as his enemies sneered. But on this occasion, many people were raised to life. And Matthew tells us that after Jesus rose from the dead, they went into the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and they showed themselves to many people. Now, if you're all like me, that raises all kinds of questions in your mind. Who got to see these guys? What did they do from Friday till Sunday? And the biggest one of all, what happened to them after Jesus rose? Martin Luther thought that they ascended physically back up to heaven, just like Elijah did in the Old Testament. But the Bible tells us nothing. Nothing except that this really happened. The grave gave up at least part of its dead. The grave will give up all its dead when Jesus returns. My friends, what further proof do we need that Jesus is all that he claimed to be. At least one person who was standing there that day recognized that truth. The centurion, the officer who was in charge, was terrified. And he said, surely this was the Son of God. Now how much he understood about Jesus at that moment is impossible for us to say, but the evidence demanded a verdict. And my friends, that evidence still stands today. We live in a world 
that constantly puts God on trial. A word, a world that constantly tests Jesus' claims and quite frankly finds them wanting. We live in a world that demands proof before it will believe what God says. And the only proof that it's going to get is the gospel. We can't go back in time and watch these things for ourselves. There were no video cameras to record these events for us. All we have is the testimony of the people who were there, and God bases all his claims on that evidence. And it is enough. No, a skeptic wouldn't agree with me. They wouldn't consider that to be proof because that person is a skeptic. They want us to prove some other kind of proof, whatever that would be. But you know what? They still can't win the argument because God built his power into the gospel. The power of the gospel can actually reach into the heart of the most hearted unbeliever and make that man or woman into a believer. And the gospel has the power to reach into our hearts, to strengthen our faith when it is attacked, to comfort us when life hurts, to keep us on the path to heaven when everything around us is trying to knock us off that path. My friends, on Good Friday, God gave us the ultimate proof of his love. Jesus let men nail him to the cross, and all he did was pray for the people who were torturing him. Jesus comforted a dying thief with the promise that that very day he would be in heaven with his Lord. Jesus loved his mother and provided for her in her old age. And then Jesus endured that hell. He took on himself the sins that you and I commit every single day of our lives. And he paid for them all. And his human body showed just how much that cost Jesus when it's tormented by thirst. And then Jesus gave evidence of what he was doing. He said, it is finished. Everything that he had come to do was done. Of course, when he said that, he was including the death that he was about to die. And then Jesus committed his spirit into his father's hands. Jesus knew that all our sins were paid for. Jesus knew that those saints who were about to come out of their tombs would be God's own evidence of that fact. Jesus knew that he was going home to heaven. So he offered us one more piece of evidence. He gave up his spirit. Jesus chose the exact moment when his lungs would stop breathing and his heart would stop beating and his brain would stop thinking and he led the path to heaven for us. My friends, on Good Friday, over and over again, Jesus gave us the proof, the evidence that we base all our hopes on when we come back here on Sunday morning, we will focus on the greatest evidence of all. But we don't have to leave here today despairing. We leave here today comforted because Jesus died for us. And now our sin is defeated and we belong to him. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll now bring our offering to the Lord.
We'll continue with responsive prayer that's printed on page 9. Please rise. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you are a just God who accepts nothing less than perfection. All too often we fail to realize how much our sin offends you. We forget that the wages of sin truly is death. We forget that there actually is a hell. Lead us to recognize the seriousness of our sinfulness. Lead us also to admit our inability to make things right with you. Today we are reminded not only of your justice, but also of your love. You did not spare your own son, but gave him up as a ransom for each one of us. Comfort us with the knowledge of this great love. Give us the peace that the forgiveness of sins brings. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you for paying the debt that we could not pay. We thank you for coming to earth so that we could be with you forever in heaven. Son of God, you offered up your body as an unblemished sacrifice for sin and commended our spirit into the hands of your Father. Teach us to cast the cares of this brief life on our Heavenly Father and commit our bodies and souls to his love. Give us courage to face death, Lord, as we offer you our personal thanks for the forgiveness that you have given us and for the home that you have won for us. The cross was once an instrument of death. It is now a sign of life. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Matthew 27. Many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and who had served with him there were, were there watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb that had been cut in the rock. He rolled a large stone over the tomb's entrance and left. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day, which was the day after the preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered in the presence of Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said that while he was alive, after three days I will rise again. So give a command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might steal his body and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the, tomb, made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and posting a guard. The gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. 